Uh, I am very happy to be moderating this panel. We have many distinguished speakers. Um, I'll do a very quick introduction of the three of them, let them um, speak a little bit to uh, the reason why we're here and what we should be thinking about, and we'll then uh, ask, you know, blurt in and ask re re hopefully relevant questions. Um, to immediately to my left is Gordon Borrell. He is the CEO of Borrell Associates, which is primarily a, a media consulting firm. Uh, his work has been quoted frequently in Wall Street Journal, New York Times, and Ad Age, and Forbes. He's appeared on CNN and various TV networks. He originally started as a reporter and editor for the Virginia Pilot in Virginia. Um, and in that time period, he then worked on conceptualizing and creating Infinet, which is an internet access and hosting company that later split up and sold to Earthlink and to Gannett. Um, he then also worked as a vice president for the new, uh, the new media for Landmark Communications. Uh, he is currently an executive board member of the local media association and is past president of the Newspaper Associ Association of America's New Media Federation. Francella Ochillo uh, is vice president uh, of the National uh, Policy and General Council of the National Hispanic Media Coalition. Um, she uh, has a BS in marketing from Morgan State University and a JD from John Marshall Law School in Chicago. Uh, she works primarily uh, to help um, the discussion in regulatory circles to discuss anything that relates to digital divides, um, diversity and minority presences, um, viewpoint diversity. Uh, she's worked on um, filings with the net neutrality arguments, uh, lifeline considerations, and media considerations at the FCC. Jeffrey Warshaw is the founder and CEO of Connoisseur, or you want to say, how do you say Connoisseur. It? Connoisseur <laughs> Media. You should let me take over marketing. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, he, uh, he's been a lifelong broadcaster. He started his first station uh, while he was still a, school, a student at um, the Wharton School of Business. Um, and then in 1997, he founded the Connoisseur <laughs> Communications Partners, which was a 39-station group. Uh, he later sold that to Cumulus Broadcasting. Uh, he formed uh, now Connoisseur Media, which operates 31 radio station brands and digital assets in eight markets. Uh, Jeff is also on the board of directors of the National Association of Broadcasters, the Radio Advisory Bo uh, Bureau, and a member of the Nielsen Advisory Board. All right, so with that, I, oh, I, and I never introduced myself. My name is Michelle Connolly. <laughs> I'm very famous. Um, I am a professor at Duke uh, University. Uh, I am an economist. I worked uh, at two different stints at the Federal Communications Commission as, as their chief economist, which is why I have at least a little bit of knowledge on some of these issues. Um, and, and before I get the panel started, I did want to reiterate something that I, I kind of teed up when, when I was speaking with, with Commissioner Carr, um, and that is that when I have uh, studied and looked at uh, the media ownership rules, uh, the, the goal is always stated to increase diversity, localism, and competition. Uh, but what we observe is they have failed to do this. If, if the goal of these rules was to achieve a certain outcome, they have utterly failed. Um, and in fact, so have they, they've not only not succeeded, but in many cases they've actually created the exact opposite effect from their intended one. Um, so I think that uh, that's a very important point to make that the, the same policy levers keep being pulled despite the fact that the outcomes are not changing and are not going in the direction that we want to and there is no sense of using evidence uh, based research to really uh, disprove this notion that somehow limiting ownership is going to achieve all these social goods. So with that said, I will pass the um, mic to Gordon. 
Okay, well, um, thank you for inviting me and thank you for being here. Uh, I think a lot of what Commissioner Carr said was, uh, was spot on. My job is to track lifeblood, I think you used that word, of local media, which is advertising. We tend to focus on audiences and content and news, and that's really important, but 60% to 70% of revenues for newspapers and for television stations comes from advertising. So these advertisers fund these media entities. For radio, it's 70 to 90 percent, most cases 90 percent, of their revenues, their operating revenues for programming, for sales reps, for disc jockeys, etc., comes from advertisers. So what I tell these local media companies, and they are in much more crisis than I think anybody in this room really realizes. We see it every day. Some of them are dying. Half of the newspapers in this country don't make money. They lose money. There have been about 40 percent of the weekly newspapers in this country uh, that have died. These are county newspapers, basically. We're down to about 6,000 of them. We used to have about 10. About 150 daily newspapers have died, and there are about to be more. We're on the precipice of, of seeing quite a few media companies die. And, and that's the first wave. That's print, because they come with an inherent cost that the broadcast media doesn't have, and that's the cost of the product that has to be physically delivered. Radio is right behind. Jeff will tell you radio is a very strong medium, and it is. It's a very, very popular medium, but it is also a medium that is in, in trouble as well. There are over 11,000 FM and AM licenses in this country, 11,000. That's about 56 for every television market, 56 radio stations for every TV market. Can't really support that. And then there are eight commercial television stations for every market. And by the way, there are also tele or Yellow Pages books. So I guess when I look at this whole universe of advertising, which is where I live in that local advertising part, the job of these businesses are to help these media companies is to help local businesses, local entrepreneurs sell things. And they're under this great duress from companies like Google or Facebook or now Amazon. And it's come in three waves, and I'll just end, end with this. We've seen the share of local advertising for local media companies go from 100% traditional media companies down to 47%. 47% is the share of local advertising that they're getting. The rest goes to Google, Facebook, and a myriad of other out-of-market, we call them, pure play companies. It's getting harder and harder for these local media entities to help marketers in their local communities sell stuff, to provide a voice for them, to provide copy, to provide something that works for them. And that's put these media companies in a lot of trouble. First wave was Google. That brought the share of local media uh, advertising, local media's ownership of, of advertising down to about 70%. The second wave was Facebook. They were up to about $38 billion last year in US advertising. And that brought the share down to about 50%. The third wave has just hit us, and it's Amazon. They did about $3 billion last year in advertising. Not very many people noticed. And forecasters on Wall Street are now saying Amazon will be up to about $38 billion within two and a half years. And that's the third wave, and it's going to hit local media companies pretty, pretty hard. So I'm glad we're having this discussion. I agree with a lot of your comments. And the young man who got up and said, why do we need to regulate media at all anymore? It makes no sense. And you said it doesn't seem to be helping media. So that's my piece. Franchella, do you want to tell us your viewpoint on this and how you see the history of this mark, this, these developments? Sure. So my name is Francella, and um, I am. This is my first time getting to um, talk about this at the press club, and I'm really excited about just getting to uh, be the minority voice. Uh, the truth is that um, a lot of people aren't going to agree necessarily with my positions, but I want to start by bringing up, um, following up on a question that came up, and also giving a little bit of the background on why uh, these rules are essential. Um, one of the questions that was asked in the Q and A was why the government's regulating uh, this market at all, and I think that it's important to start by thinking about a statistic um, that was just mentioned. So, of the 11,000 radio stations that are in the country, how many of them are owned by women or minority owners? And I think that even by generous estimates, if we're at less than 20 percent, we have to ask very serious questions about why. 
And the truth is that the FCC for decades systematically excluded women and minorities from being able to get licenses. The FCC intentionally injected itself into that process. So the thing is you can't let the agency that has actually been complicit in excluding people from getting licenses for decades when years now in 2019, it doesn't reflect the population when we don't say, what are we doing about this? and why that doesn't give us pause. Now, there are a couple of things that I totally agree with. I think that the market is changing rapidly. I think that it's important to make sure that radio broadcasters are able to uh, have revenue and to be able to be robust entities in their communities, because the truth is, if they can't afford to stay open, if they do have a Dell laptop running their, their entity, then we have a real problem. But the truth is, why is a laptop running that station? What have we done to empower people who maybe don't look like most owners? What have we done to empower them with giving them the capital or the experience or just the levers of power that they need to actually run those stations? And so I think that it's important, you know, one of the things that Michelle brought up, I, I agree that you know, when we think about the bedrock principles that are included in any policy making on, you know, the market, we're always thinking about does it improve competition? Does it improve, you know, the diversity of voices? Are we bringing in new viewpoints? These are, these are bedrock principles that we can't really set aside or water down. But at the time that we do the quadrennial review, it's not just a time to say, do we need to get rid of rules? I think that it's a time for us to evaluate, do the current rules serve the public interest? So that might be an opportunity to say, yeah, maybe we need to think about redefining what's qualified as a radio broadcaster. Maybe we need to think about how do we support small and mid-sized stations being able to get a little bit more, to be more competitive in their advertising revenue. I totally agree with that. But what concerns me is that we can't um, make believe that uh, traditional radio stations or even TV stations for that matter are equivalent to or substitutes for online providers. Because the truth is that when you're using the public airwaves, the exchange for that was that there's a public interest requirement and that you actually have an obligation to serve the community in which you're licensed. So I think that some of this isn't necessarily about necessarily about deregulating. I think some of it is if we aren't achieving the goals that we've set out in terms of improving the diversity of voices, improving localism, supporting competition, then what do we need to do to address those in particular problems and thinking about ways that when we're deregulating, asking really hard questions about who will that benefit? Because what does concern me as an advocate is I don't have a knee-jerk reaction against all consolidation is bad. That's not what I have a knee-jerk reaction against. What concerns me is that I know that cross-ownership amplifies power. And if you are part of that bottom rung and you have no leverage, when you consolidate or at least enter into an agreement with another company, you do not go in there on equal footing. It is not the same. And so the truth is that those smaller, maybe minority and women-owned businesses are essentially subsumed rather than partners in those contracts. And so what are we doing to support those voices? So I think through this conversation, I'm glad to have it. I'm glad to be healthy opposition, but I want us to all really think carefully about is it that we're just asking to eliminate certain rules, or is it that we should be saying, we're not meeting our goals here, so yes, we should change these rules, but that needs to be accompanied by other changes? So if you don't mind, I'll ask a follow-up sure. question. So in line with that, what do you think of the FCC incubator program? Do you think it has a, a, a good chance of succeeding or not, and if, you know, depending on that, do you see, what alternatives do you see to try and promote these goals? I'll say this about the incubator program, because I actually just got off the phone with NEB um, yesterday. I have a great relationship with them. I talk to them all the time, even though we agree on nothing on fight lanes. Um, <laughs> all the time. <laughs> and so um, I appreciate a good faith effort. I appreciate good ideas. What I would like to see is a more robust effort, whether it's asking, can we do some sort of, whether it's getting like, uh, you know, when I heard the statistic that you had uh, started in college, like maybe we reach out to college students and ask them for ideas on how we get more people into the broadcasting industry. How about we tap into other sources to come up with ideas to bring in a more diverse um, set of ownership? Because I just don't think it's enough for us to rely on the incubator program being the only answer. I don't think that it's adequate, but I appreciate the effort. 
Um, Jeff, I, I'm under a mandate to first ask you how you got here today. <laughs> uh, I was meant to fly out of uh, LaGuardia. My flight was canceled or postponed, so I ended up jumping in a cab and going to, uh, uh, to Penn Station and got here just in time. So I'm happy to be here. I'm very I'm honored I to be here. I heard a scooter was here. involved. Yeah, <laughs> yeah um, uh, all the different Uber vehicles were involved. <laughs> Uh, so, a few things. I really appreciate everybody's comments. Uh, first off, um, the idea that radio uh, doesn't compete with digital is ridiculous. Uh, in every possible way we compete with digital, we compete with all the other media. Uh, advertisers view uh, digital as often interchangeable with radio. Um, our listeners um, and, uh, and the people who consume media in freely go between digital and traditional media. The idea that somehow uh, we are one world unto ourse ourselves is just ridiculous and it doesn't, it, it doesn't hold any water. And there's no way that regulations should um, em em embrace that, that absolutely archaic notion that radio is its own universe. So, I mean, that is absolutely, uh, for somebody who has been doing this since I was a kid, and I'm not a kid any longer, uh, and I've been doing business in you know, all the glamour markets in America, Flint and Youngstown and Quad Cities, Waterloo, Evansville, Rapid City, Bismarck, Billings, Montana, Erie, PA. So I have a fair, and that's just maybe half the markets that I've operated in. So I have a fairly good smattering of what's going on in rural and smaller town America. Um, the idea that our advertisers um, aren't uh, departing um, our, um, our, our products is just, it's, it's just not the truth. And um, so no, no matter what happens, to ignore that is to do a tremendous disservice. Um, we are, are the uh, local medium in most of our markets. When there's a shooting, we own stations in, uh, in Connecticut, when there's a the Sandy Hook shooting takes place, radio is the entity, is the, is the medium that's there to provide the local service. In fact, CNN came into our studios while we were taking phone calls, and that was their local, that was their coverage of Sandy Hook. And when the politicians need to be heard, radio provides that opportunity, and when there's local news, radio provides that opportunity, and there would be a tremendous loss if, if local radio disappeared. And we are just not competing on a level playing field. We're not looking for any help. We're not looking for you know, special kudos for doing a great job, which we do as an industry. All we want is a fair fight. And Google and Facebook, um, not only are they unregulated, but they have a completely different set of rules. Uh, Spotify, um, th these are companies that don't have to make money. Apple s sells devices, that's what they have Apple Music for. Google is selling your data. Amazon is selling your data. That's how they make money. They never have to make money servicing their local communities and going to their local advertisers. And so that's, it's for them to be unregulated while we are hamstrung is, in, is really, um, at the end of the day, the public will suffer. And I am absolutely sympathetic to the minority ownership. In fact, my thesis at Wharton was the opportunity entrepreneurial, op opportunities for entrepreneurial uh, minorities in broadcasting. And um, uh, we, I actually sold my, the station I built um, to, to a minority controlled entity. So, and I, and I, so I've seen some of the rules work, but right now, forgetting being a minority, forgetting being a white man, there is no equity capital for new investment in radio. The public radio companies are decimated. It's virtually impossible to raise money to, in, of equity capital. And so from my perspective, if you want the money to come to the minorities, to, so they can, minorities and women, so they can buy stations, have it be a stronger industry. Because right now, uh, it, it doesn't matter who you are, you're having a very, very difficult time raising capital. And uh, you know, I've, in, in the markets that we do business, um, if we could own more stations, we, we would very often be buying out uh, a national competitor who um, has cut down on, on local service. We would be able to provide more diverse formats. We would be able to provide more local service, more live and local uh, coverage, more news, more public affairs. And um, it doesn't matter where you live. 
uh, to be local. What matters is that you have a commitment to the, the, lo the local markets that you're doing business. So I'm not sure, you know, it's, it's hard, more work to run local operations. It's more work to retain and train new salespeople. It's getting harder and harder as we compete with digital media. But the idea that, uh, that in somehow this is a gift to local broadcasters, this is what radio needs to remain local and to be able to provide uh, a service in our communities. We need to be given a level playing field. I wouldn't say it's a gift, it's uh, removing the foot from your jugular. <laughs> but I have no opinion. All right. <laughs> um, how much do you think you're hampered, Jeff, by this, the fact that radio started out as a, a broadcasting entity and is, I assume, still primarily a broadcasting entity, um, but you are making inroads into digital as well. No. Well, well. First off, we, we we stream all of our radio stations. But you know, the fact is that every uh, listener that we have that leaves our terrestrial listening to go to digital costs us money, because of the rules. We we, we cannot make money on streaming. That's the music line because of the fees that we pay Sound Exchange. So it's not a and and the same thing goes for Alexa. If you want to have Alexa, so they know every single conversation you've ever had. <laughs> It's your choice, um, you, you, and you, you stream our radio stations, we don't make money from that. It's wonderful that we have listeners and we're able to, you know, it can be the new clock radio in everybody's home, but the fact is that nothing, nothing replaces um, the terrestrial signal. And like on my way to the airport, I stuck my phone in and I got, you know, Apple CarPlay and I could not find a radio dial. And to, for the idea that radio isn't competing with that, uh, it's, it's, it, it defies any logic. Gordon, maybe um, I could ask you a little bit more about uh, do you know, the, the market for advertising, and do advertisers see digital advertising as being different from advertising o over broadcast? It's interesting. We run the, the, the largest survey of local advertisers in the country. It's currently running, and I asked them this this year to put in a question about John Wanamaker's lament. If you recall, that was John Wanamaker, a retailer 100 years ago, said half of my advertising works, half of it doesn't. Trouble is I don't know which half is which. So I asked, let's put that in and let's ask local advertisers how they feel. It used to be they agreed with it 100%. They just couldn't figure it out. Now 40% don't agree with it, and it's growing. We tested it a couple of times since we launched the survey. So what's happening with local advertisers is now their perception is that they have more data that comes with this digital media. In the past, they would get reports from radio stations or from television stations or from newspapers that said, look how big our readership is, look how big our audience is, you know, these are the people you're reaching. And they didn't quite believe it. They just didn't know whether it really worked. They knew some of it worked and some of it didn't. Now they have data in the form of clicks, mm -hmm. um, in the form of likes, page views, et cetera, et cetera. And the reality is half of that advertising works and half of it doesn't. A lot of those chick clicks come from you know, robots or from China, from other countries. So it, it, their perception is now that they have data that it works. I will say this, and this is just startling when you get down to it, these advertisers, these local advertisers are pretty smart. We asked them, this is a year ago, you said you bought newspaper advertising, rated on a scale of one to five with five being the best. You said you bought radio advertising, rated on a scale, you said you bought search advertising, Facebook advertising, etc. So we took all the traditional forms of media, radio, TV, newspapers, broadcast and print, cable, outdoor, etc averaged it out, so we got an effectiveness rating for traditional, and we took all the digital forms, search advertising, social media, email advertising, banner ads, et cetera, and we averaged it out. They were exactly the same. They felt that they're both. So what we've found is that recently, advertisers, and this is in the past six, six months, and it's changed pretty quickly, advertisers are now buying a package. So they will buy radio advertising with digital because most of radio sellers now are also selling some forms of 
digital advertising in the form of banner ads or maybe they even will do some search engine marketing for the advertiser. Maybe they'll help them with their website. Same thing with newspaper companies, TV, radio. The traditional media industry generated $10.5 billion last year from digital advertising. So they're driving some of that $67 billion in digital advertising that was sold last year, small amount. But in the end, what the advertiser sees again is they're on par. They're just getting traditional media with digital media. I'm going to say something that's going to make Jeff really happy in a moment. Um, they're on par, and they want to buy it as a package, and they really need the help of local media companies to help them figure it out, because what do they get when they call Facebook? What do they get when they call Google to help them figure out why this, you know, $10 per click is not, isn't working for them? So the thing that, that Jeff, you're going to be happy with is that there is one medium that drives digital traffic and digital results better than any other, and it's radio. Radio just does a hell of a job, and advertisers are beginning to see that. That hope is there, and again, my concern is that as these companies see lower and lower margins, as it's harder and harder to raise capital because of all the issues that are, that are happening with audiences, et cetera, et cetera, um, it's not going to be enough time. There's not going to be enough time to support the companies that are out there that support their local communities. So then this segues back to the original question that we, I wanted to ask Jeff again about the, the uh, announced purported death of radio. How do you feel about that statement? Do you think it's true? Yeah. What do you think does, yes. will be uh, the I mean, saving radio, grace? Radio um, has the, still the greatest reach of any medium by far. Um, it has, uh, you know, gets tremendous results. It's the most trusted medium. It's, you know, certainly far from dead at this point. But an ounce of prevention, um, you know, it's right now, uh, if, if we are kind of liberated to allow people to own entities, and, and, you know, keeping in mind that a lot of the radio stations are owned by big public companies, you know, I mean, they're, it's not just like individuals. Um, so uh, that does skew the statistics a little bit. But, uh, you know, you, if you... Um, Radio is strong right now. It's uh, certainly not as strong as it used to be. It has a strong, a smaller sh local share, um, and it's kind of a, a vicious circle, right? Because the, um, the 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 harder it gets, the less resources we have. The less resources we have, the m our product suffers. Uh, we we have to sell more commercials in order to pay the bills. We become less competitive to the streamers who don't have to do anything to make money because they don't care about making money. Um, and that's the reality. We are competing with a bunch of companies that their model does not require them to make money doing what we do. And yet, we, we're the ones that have the local service uh, that, we're, that we are, in, that number one, that we're charged to do, and number two, that we have to do in order to justify people listening to us. So um, radio is far from dead. It's certainly much harder than it used to be. Um, and it will continue to get much harder um, unless, um, unless, and maybe even if, uh, we get um, the relief from these burdensome rules that, that we're talking about. But it's certainly not dead, and, and I, you know, I pray for the, the country that it doesn't die, because when that, when it, when, if radio were to go away, um, there would be a tremendous, it would be a tremendous loss to these local communities. And, um, you, and I don't see um, any uh, you know, Facebooks or, or Google or Amazon stepping up and you know, putting people in the street to, um, to find out what's really going on in the communities and providing local service and doing fundraising for people who need, in those communities who need money, and a voice for the voiceless. I just don't see that happening. And, it's, um, and, and so it would be a tremendous loss. Um, and uh, you know, again, we're not, I don't think the industry is asking for a handout. And I, just as a uh, point of information, I'm on the ownership committee of the National Association of Broadcasters, which was referenced, and uh, we had, there was minority and female representation on that, on the, uh, that committee, and, um, it was, and who supported the, the NAB proposal. So um, I actually don't, you know, I think the NAB proposal didn't go far enough. Uh, I think that the idea that, should be, that, that radio should have any ownership rules is, is archaic, but, um, you know, again, it's not necessarily politically feasible to have all the rules go away. There's some questions. Yeah. 
Jackson. I want to address the question that, or the issue that Franchella raised with minority ownership with women and minorities. <clears throat> uh, under the Reagan administration, the FCC instituted a grandfather clause, a regulation whereby a major network like NBC could not own a radio station and a TV station in the same market. So NBC here in Washington was, was, was forced to sell this radio station WKYS. And when they did, um, a minority ownership came forward. And that regulation opened up the doors for minority ownership in the 1980s. Uh, Kathy Hughes, she was the owner of WOL here, AM Bay, and she proposed to buy WKOS. Well, she didn't get a chance to do that at that time. Um, it was a, a conglomerate of lawyers and, and actors, and they all came in to buy it. About four years later, KOS was, KOS was sold, and she bought it. Kathy Hughes bought it. 1980s. Today, and she's a female, Today, she owns 40, 54 radio stations and 16 markets. And she owns six stations here in DC, which is a major market. I believe it's number eight. I'm not sure. Um, but somewhere around the top 10. And she also owns four Baltimore stations, which is the 20th, 20th market. So my ownership has zoomed under the Reagan administration's regulations on the grandfather clause. I can't say, and, 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 and if you ask me, and you said 20% minorities own those 11,000 stations. If you ask me, the blockage is not on the FCC. It's on the black elite who owns the minority ownership. They're blocking it. <laughs> Go look. They're blocking it. So my question to you is that how would you address the issue of minority ownership for women that are not part of the black elite, like myself, if I want to own a radio station? How do we get the, to do that if we are blocked from the top black elite. Oh, I think that, just to be clear, mm -hmm. I think that that's fantastic that there are any minority owners that have any sort of chain ownership. And I know that even in the 1980s, that was something that was probably the first time that you started to see that. I'm glad, I think that's wonderful. I think what I'm doing is I'm speaking for people who might be new entrants who just don't have the capital or the levers of power to get into the market. So the thing is, I'm not saying that the FCC is the only one who's responsible. I think that there are always gonna be in any industry, there might be people who are blocking it from the top. So I think that there are market forces. Mm -hmm. I think that there's the FCC. I think that the truth is that we need to all be working together. And what I was saying about when we're thinking about deregulating, the public interest standard is not just an economic analysis. And I just think that we need to be aware of the fact that there are advertising dollars, I get it. Everybody's thinking about what do we do to make these stations more robust, but there are other calculations that go into that. And I think that it's important to support um, the local initiatives. I think that that's great that that worked out in Washington, D.C., but there are lots of cities where that's not the same story. And so that's why I'm not denying that that's a great idea. I'm just saying that we need to be aware of the fact that there are a lot of owners who may not be a part of the 90% that supported NAB's proposal. So, mm -hmm. I, I, so I'm not disagreeing with you, so I'm a little, maybe I'm a little bit confused about your question. I just want to add that Kathy Hughes, um, she owns Urban Radio One, which is the ninth highest earning African-American business in the United States. Okay. So it's there. Oh, but I'm not, you see, and but, just to be clear, because mm -hmm. I feel like something that I've said has been mischaracterized, mm -hmm. that there are no minority owners. I said that by generous calculations of the 11,000 radio stations in the country, less than 20% are women and minorities. And that is a number that should give us pause, considering that almost 50% of the population in the United States are made up of people of color. And so I was asking, mm -hmm. what is the FCC doing to actually support initiatives that increase the number of people of color in the industry? But Kathy Hughes has locked up the, the, the markets um, the black population in, in those markets. So blacks are not nationwide. They're 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 they're, they're, they're conglomerate in certain parts of the country. And so where they are, that's where she is. Okay, and that's great. I would love to talk to Kathy Hughes, and Kathy Hughes would hear the same thing from me. So I come from a place in Louisiana where if I went to go and start my own radio station, there would have been very serious blockades where I lived in Louisiana. So I'm just giving you my experience, mm -hmm. but I think that's wonderful that Kathy Hughes that that worked out. Thank you. Thank I'd you. like to go on the record again. And I've done it in the trades before. If any minority or any woman is looking to buy a radio station and they'd like any free <laughs> advice, I'm more than happy to help. That's great. I like to hear that. That's great. I appreciate that. Uh, Hi. Um, when I was a little boy, 
hard for me to remember back that far, but I was a newspaper boy for the Washington Evening Star, which no longer exists. And I had 125 houses on my route, which was every single house in the neighborhood. Everybody got a paper. I lived 10 blocks away from where I grew up as a little boy. I walk out the house every morning and I pick up my three newspapers. Nobody else on my block gets a newspaper. So I'm sorry. Newspapers, I think, are dead. They are antiques. With total respect, uh, I think radio is in its decline and is going to die. And you said, how are they going to compete against us? I don't know the answer to that, but some of the things that occur to me are robots and drones and so on. They're going to be there, and they're going to be there cheaper and as good as radio is today. So, and I don't like government regulation, and I heard someone talk about government subsidization, and I don't want government subsidization. I don't think it works. So newspapers dead, radio dying, gonna die, Zuckerberger and company on the rise. So the question to me is, how do we prevent fascism? How do we prevent the consolidation amongst the Facebooks and the uh, other social media outlets and being the voice that tells us how to think what's right, what's proper, and what's improper. That's, I think, where we're headed. I think you're partially right um, when you look at the number of newspapers that have folded. Um, but I think if you go to local communities, smaller communities, newspapers are, are thriving pretty well. They are the voice of, of record in those communities because the larger daily newspaper doesn't cover those smaller fringe communities. There are still 6,000 6, county or, or local weekly newspapers in this country and about 1,300. And there are a lot of radio stations too. So, so I, I think if you look at any individual market as a TV market, and there are 211 across this country, there are 126 on average local media entities competing in that market, 126, and that's just way too many. So when you say newspapers are dead, some are dying, some have already died, but not all of them. So what I, ha I think is happening is a thinning of the pack. We're over media in a lot of markets. There are just way too many radio stations competing for a smaller and smaller piece of the pie. There have been too many newspapers. There have been too many Yellow Pages books. But if you go, startling fact, to a community of fewer than 100,000 people and ask them which they prefer when they look up a business listing, Google or the Yellow Pages book, what do you think their answer is? It's the Yellow Pages book because it provides more relevant listings. So you have to be careful saying newspapers are dead, radio's dead, et cetera, et cetera. There have been loads of people who predicted the death of newspapers and the death of radio and the death of TV. Projected out 20, 30 years, yeah, the game is going to be very different. But there are quite a few that are still thriving out there and doing some pretty decent margins. And it just it kind of almost depends community by community. Yeah, I'm, I'm, regulations that are old and, and, uh, and are past their time will kill the industry before drones will, I can assure you. <laughs> uh, my, we have talented, dedicated professionals who serve their community, who are vital, who are trusted, beloved, and providing tremendous local service. I'm not afraid of drones. I'm not afraid of robots. What I'm afraid of is rules that are hampering us to do, allow us to do our jobs. Here, here. Uh, hi, Monty Taylor, Com Daily. Uh, Mr. Warshaw, you, uh, I don't know if you were here for it, but uh, Commissioner Carr seemed to telegraph that he was leaning towards the NAB proposal for the subcab regulation, which you just said you didn't like. I know that you had asked for everything to get wiped away. If, 
if the FCC does, as Commissioner Carr is leaning, and they and they do the NAB subcap proposal, is that enough to save radio, oh, in your opinion? Yeah. Well, first off, I mean, I voted for it and I helped write it, so I definitely am for it. I just, you know, I mean, I'll take, you know, uh, I'll take, I will take uh, any help that we can get. Um, I think that, uh, you know, from a broadcasting, from being a local broadcaster, you know, the idea that having too many stations would hurt the public interest, I know better than that. But, um, and I think that certainly in a lot of the smaller markets, um, it's, would, would, you know, having, being, being able to own more stations would be helpful to be able to provide more local service. But I'm a, a proponent of the NAB proposal. Um, and um, I think that um, it, would, it would be, uh, it might not be perfect, um, but it would be a tremendous improvement over what, what their current rules are. You want to follow up? Or? Yeah, I do have a quick follow up. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, you, uh, if they do the NAB proposal, uh, a lot of people have expressed a, a, a worry that it will wipe out AM stations. Do you agree that that will happen? Will you buy AM stations if the NAB subcap proposal goes into effect? Uh, no, I would buy AM stations if there was an AM station that made sense. I wouldn't. I mean, I do think that. Uh, uh, that there there may be benefits to um, that rule. I think people will be could potentially become AM specialists. They could create new formats if the uh, if there were opportunities out there that where they were um, not as sought after. Um, and you know I wouldn't buy it just because it was available. But we certainly uh, we would be open to um, to to owning more stations of either AM or FM. I have a question about what m may be another sort of like thread in the noose of this situation, which is Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, um, which basically exempts internet service providers from liability for things like defamation. And um, it basically means you can't hold platforms responsible for that type of thing and you can't threaten them with legal liability, whereas all the legal liability will still remain with radio, with local television news and with the newspapers. And I've heard this from the newspaper group when there's a series of stuff going on in Congress with the antitrust trying to get news media to be able to organize for a series of years. And one of their big issues is that this liability situation needs to change. And I'm wondering if your industry feels the same. Well, we try not to be indecent, you know. Um, it's, it's tr honestly, it isn't uh, a major issue for us. It's not, not a driving, that, that isn't one of the, the high priorities for, from our perspective. And I think that Section 230 is a totally separate conversation, but I think that it's worth having because just also like thinking about how these online entities, these platforms are classified, I also think that's an important conversation to have as well. The, the News Media Alliance, the Newspaper Association, has devoted pretty significant resources to to making that case, as you may know. Um, it's a bigger, much bigger issue for, for print newspapers because of their size. They still are, um, despite the size of any television station or radio cluster in any market, they're still, they still tend to be the largest media entity in any market, and so that's a big target for a lot of folks who want to file defamation suits. Any additional questions? Um, one thing we haven't focused a great deal on is do you, for all three of you, the recommendations that you've had or put forward, do you see them as being equally relevant in larger markets and smaller markets? Or do you, in your mind, do you really see a distinction between the larger markets and the smaller markets? Well, I'll, I'll just jump in and just say that, that smaller markets are much different than, than larger markets. There tends to be uh, an easier go of it for, for smaller uh, companies because there's less competition. So I'll be in Philadelphia tomor tomorrow to work with a number of different companies, print, broadcast, et cetera, and there are just loads of them, and they're all looking at each other in addition to digital media. If you go to a smaller local market, it's more relaxed, not, not that it's a heck of a lot easier to pry dollars from advertisers' hands because they're still enamored of Facebook and Google and things like that. Um, but it does seem to be, Jeff, I don't know how, how you feel about it, but in markets like Erie or other markets that aren't Philadelphia, New York, or Washington, um, 
particularly radio, seems to have a, a, a better go of it in those markets because of their control, or not control, but their voice of the community. I don't know how you feel about it either. So, so I, I, I mean, I don't. I, I think that it's a market by market basis. I think generally you have um, in the smaller markets you have more guys like me that own stations and operate them rather than big public companies. And you know, uh, despite the fact that uh, values of FM stations and AM stations have declined dramatically, still the idea that like a person is going to own a station in Philadelphia it's pretty unusual. There was one, and he sold it. Um, so those, th those, those big companies um, have a different, um, very often a, a very different strategy. Uh, they, um, they, are, um, th uh, they have a much, a much larger platform and footprint. They have the um, national resources, national programming, uh, networks, um, in some cases a big app, um, uh, na nationwide concert uh, networks. Um, so they have a kind of a different economy. I mean, I... I I think, uh, in some ways, the smaller markets have better economics. In certain ways, they're much worse. You know, the uh, a market like New York might be um, se 60 or 70 times the size of an Erie, but you know, the people in the markets make twice as much money, not 60 times as much money. So um, it's you know, the the small fluctuations and um, declines have a, an immediate and profound impact on those co those markets' ability to make money and provide local service. Uh, let me just, one thing I was thinking about, Gordon, when you said that the smaller communities are facing less competition, I was thinking about, I mean, I would think they're in many ways equally um, at risk of losing to digital, but what might be different is the preference of the local community, that if people are choosing to live in certain areas, they may be more tied to that and more interested in local issues than uh, in more urban areas where people maybe are moving around more or see themselves um, less part of a small community and, and might be less interested in the local, very local issues. Um, and that may be why they're seeing kind of a, a, a relative difference in terms of the impact of digital, which as long as there's inter internet provision should be fairly ubiquitous within the markets. It's true. If you take a, a, a community like Jackson Hole, for instance, or any you know, other smaller community that's on the fringe of a television market, their television station will not come to their community and do a story about their son, you know, favorite son being becoming an Eagle Scout, for instance. But the local newspaper dude or the local radio station might have them on. So in that sense, there's a stronger affinity for and and belief that the local paper, the local radio station, local media entity of any sort, it might be a weekly paper, is more representative of, of them. They feel closer to it. As I tell people, if you go to my brother's bar in Philadelphia and sit down on the stool and say, that Philadelphia Inquirer, what a liberal rag that is, the guy next to you will buy you a beer. But if you go to Jackson Hole and say that Jackson Hole, and I can't remember the name of the paper, the news bulletin is you know a horrible rag, the guy next to you will punch you in the nose because he knows the reporter, he knows an ad director, he knows the publisher, and you know they featured his son as an Eagle Scout last year or something like that. It's just that, that tightness of the small local community where the bigger daily newspaper and the big TV stations just can't provide that level of coverage to those smaller communities, and there's a a closer knit, I guess, to them because they're just, they're smaller communities. Everybody knows everybody. I mean, we have radio stations, for example, in Fairfield County, which is outside in, you know, 50 miles from New York City. And if you ask the people in Fairfield County about their local radio stations, they, they would tell you when they've bumped into the morning man or when they've seen the radio station doing an event in the car park, you know, dog park, or they've, you know, when they've um, gone into a restaurant and there was a remote broadcast going on. Uh, that's much more commonplace than in New York. Um, even though they're very close geographically, it, it, in many ways, local radio has a different uh, meaning mm -hmm. to uh, to people in a in a town of you know 100,000, 200,000 than it does to, you know 10 and, million. And probably also a very different meaning to people who are 40 plus versus 15. Uh, I know my, my children don't, I think, know what radio is. I think is. that in, generally for 15-year-olds, um, it, it's not a high passion area, no matter <laughs> where you are. Um, not yet, at least yeah. until they start working. 
<laughs> Sorry. Francella, you were about to say something, and I stopped. Uh, the only thing I was going to say, the way that I think about it is um, I work a lot on digital access issues. Mm -hmm. And so I think a lot when I'm in Louisiana, if I'm in a place that I don't have internet access, I'm more likely to actually put on the radio or put it on my car or when I'm at home, as opposed to a t a, if I'm in a place like DC where I can get a signal anywhere. So that's what would be the difference for me. Then that would actually, argue, well, if, if one thinks that the uh, ownership rules are, are capping and harming the provision of local, the, local uh, news and services, then, then that would be an argument that the areas that have more difficulty in uh, internet, in broadband provision, would be the areas that really need the removal of the restrictions the most. That's completely possible, and I think that that's, that's one way of having a tailored solution, mm -hmm. rather than just saying, in general, we should deregulate, because for me, the standard for deregulating should always be not just does it, you know, is it not gonna harm the public, but does it actually advance the public's interest? All right. One last question. It was um, kind of linked to my thoughts about um, how traditional media and digital media sort of uh, for lack of a better word, it's more or less converging as far as dollars spent. And as it relates to your comment, how, I mean, how can you close the gap when there are certain areas that don't really have the infrastructure that would allow local media to have a playing field to begin with? And how, is that, how does that play into broader strategies or policies that are related to investment in certain communities? Because mm -hmm. you mentioned, as, as is true, certain areas don't even have coverage. So, I mean, even if, let's say, traditional media has also um, become more competitive at, at the, on a regional basis by having um, a, digital, a strong digital component of original content or whatnot, um, it still sort of wouldn't reach everyone it needs to reach. I agree with you there, and one thing that uh, um, goes back to one of my earlier comments that we need to come up with a better uh, supply of ideas because the truth is that we're not gonna come up with all of them here in Washington, D.C. Um, I come from a place where when you go home, when I go home, people ask me how I'm doing and then they actually wait to hear the answer and it's a totally different <laughs> dynamic than here in Washington, D.C. where people, it's very transactional and when you go home, people are waiting, they're listening, they're interacting. I think it's just a totally different place and I think that we need to be able to get ideas from places like that that really are interacting with their local radio staff or interacting with their TV broadcasters, I think it's totally different than the solutions we'd come up with here with here in DC. However, I don't think we need a patchwork of solutions across the country, but I do think we need to have some sort of carve outs for markets that are just different. Well, thank the panel. I wanna thank the panel and the Federalist Society again uh, for this very interesting discussion of an issue that I would hope would just go away <laughs> in a good way. <laughs>